Welcome to Beyond the Black Letter Law by Prism Chambers, a platform where we demystify legal concepts for you. Our guest today is the general counsel of one of the largest management companies in Mauritius, Okorian. She's quite new to this role, having joined Okorian in April last year. After having as our first guest a seasoned practitioner, I thought it would be quite interesting to sit down with someone who is at the start of their journey as an in-house lawyer. Today, I sit down with Hasina Anzanko. Hasina, so nice to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for welcoming me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. One of the reasons I wanted to sit down with you is that I know that you, you, you have just started your journey as a GC. You mm -hmm. joined Okorian last year. Many young lawyers often wonder whether it's necessary to have a life in private practice before they move in-house. What are your views on this? To be honest, I think it's essential to have at least some experience in private practice before moving in-house. Uh, I can speak from my personal experience. I've, when I've just been called to the bar, I came to Mauritius. I was very happy to start going to court, wearing the gown, meeting my colleagues. So it's not entirely a bad thing, but I think that it's essential to at least get to know how private practice is. When you work in private practice, you can fairly say that 90% of the work that you do would be litigation. We don't have much corporate work to do. So you get to learn what are the legal words that you use when going to court, the processes, you meet people, you get acquainted to the judge. And I think it's important on a personal front as well as a professional front as well. Personally, when I've I've been doing two years in private practice. I knew after that I didn't want to do private practice. I wanted to move into a corporate setup. So that helped me to take my career path decision and it was helpful. And also why I say it's helpful even today is because even as a general counsel, there will always be an aspect of your role that will require you to oversee litigation work. So you need to understand what's happening so that you can advise your employer, you need to know the people you're dealing with. So at times it becomes different, if, difficult, sorry, if you don't have that person to act as an intermediary between, because then the employer feel a bit lost. But by having that person here, he knows that that person is taking control on the process. So I think taking all that into account, I would say that it's essential to have at least a feel of what private practice is really about before jumping in-house. Were you in a transactional role or were you doing mainly litigation when you went private practice? I was doing mostly, I would say 90% litigation work with very little um, corporate work. And to be honest, when you are in private practice, you wouldn't receive that much corporate work. You would do probably, in the beginning, you would do a lot of pro bono work. Then you would do a little bit of criminal cases, civil cases. But in private practice, unless you've been there like for, I would say, five to ten years, initially you wouldn't have much corporate work to do. Yes, I guess unless you make the conscious decision to join a corporate law exactly. firm to do yeah, corporate work. Different. And at some point I did take that decision and I moved into a corporate setup where I was doing mostly corporate work but with a little bit of litigation on the side so I would still help the team because I knew how to draft pleadings how to go through the court documents so I would assist them at times I would even go to court for so for small matters such as postponement mm -hmm. so it's very good to have that little mix I would say rather than just having 100% corporate experience because at times you feel that not having that litigation know-how, you might feel that you don't really understand what's happening in court. Because in Mauritius, it's not the same as in UK. It's different. So I think that it's helpful. Do you miss, I, my colleagues always laugh mm -hmm. when I call it like that, do you miss the glory of the gown? I do miss that, to be honest, yeah. I, I feel that at times, you know, when you wear the gown and go to court, there's always like, a sparkle that you feel that you're going to court that but now unfortunately there is no more that's not part of my role right now sure. but it's a decision that you take taking into account is several factors that you have to weigh the balance but for sure that's something that I certainly miss. So it must have been quite a culture shock then moving from private practice where you had a mainly contentious role into in-house in a corporate service provider 
How do you think the role differs going from private practice lawyer to in-house? It's very different. It's a world of difference. To be honest, from, even when I was from a law firm, I moved into an in-house, I struggle. Let's, let's put it this way. It was not easy because there's no book there to tell you this is the role of the general counsel, this is how you do ABC. There's no, there's no dummies book for general counsel, so you have to figure it by yourself. So I went back to my code of ethics because there's some kind of misunderstanding around the role of a general counsel, but it's very different from what you do in, in, in a law firm or in a private practice. To begin with, your perspective is different. So when you're in a, in a law firm or in private practice, you will always be able to provide independent legal services to clients, to the general public. But the moment you move in-house, you automatically forsake that. So you become like, you provide legal services to your employer and its stakeholders. So that in itself restricts the, puts parameters on what you can do as a general counsel. So it's not a bad thing, but it's just that you can no longer go to court as a, as a lawyer. So you need to have an external lawyer. So what you would do as a general counsel is years with them. So that's a huge difference, especially when you've been in uh, law firm and private practice advising everyone mm -hmm. on anything. Now suddenly you find yourself having boundaries and restrictions. But it, it was a learning curve for me and I knew right now what are the things that I can do as a general counsel and what are the things that I shouldn't do. So um, over the one year it's been, I would say, a learning experience, a learning curve for me, getting acquainted to the role. But I can say right now I've been, it's been an exponential growth from where I've been, I was initially and from where I, I am now. Thank you so much for your candor because I think it's really refreshing to hear someone say that. We hear many stories in the market where certain service providers try to do the legal work in-house but it's good that you have established those boundaries and know what work you can do and what work you can't do. I think that's very important yes, for our think, profession. Um, yes, it's very important to make it clear as you join the, the organization, because let's be honest, this person you're working with, they're not legal person, they're not lawyers, so it's up to you to tell them, you know, this is something that I can't do, because if I do that, I will expose your organization to a risk, because only a law firm can do that. However, I can still help. I can be a legal support to your team internally. I will assist your team in anything, whether it be HR, finance, accounting, anything that contains a legal aspect to it, I can do that. I can even assist your client service team when they are dealing with management companies. So Ocarian is a corporate service provider, so our staff provide services to our clients. So what they do under the law is to act as company secretary. So when you act as company secretary, you must be aware of a certain legislative framework and how you go about it. And because this person don't necessarily have that legal knowledge, I'm there. I'm there to provide them with that support. So I'm more behind the scene than in the limelight. So I'm behind them, providing them with the appropriate um, knowledge, material. So I think it's very important from the very outset to put it out there because we can't, as a service provider, a management company is in fact not licensed to provide legal services. A law firm can, but not a management company. So as a general counsel, you need to know where your boundaries are and to make sure that the organization is aware of that so that that's fantastic and as i said i'm so happy to, to, <laughs> to hear you say that now coming back to the qualities of um, an in-house lawyer what would you say are your top three qualities that you think an in-house lawyer should possess i think an in-house lawyer should first of all be well versed with the different aspect of the law it's good to have an area of specialization but you need to be aware to have some kind of general knowledge because the questions that you get on a daily basis can be coming from anywhere mm -hmm. and it can be on anything so uh, you get the opportunity to learn at the same time because you don't know in everything awesome. uh, but uh, just to say that you need to be uh, to be able to adapt to this kind of environment and not say, you know, that's not my area of practice, I'm not going to look into that. You need to be open. So I think, for example, you get employment queries, you get queries from accounting, from finance, from the ops team, from the client service team. So I think you need to be 
able to show that you're versatile in that role. That's, that's key. And coming to the second uh, quality, I would say, is communication skills. Mm -hmm. So when I joined in a Korean last year, there was no legal person before. That post was created, the new function. So you can imagine everyone thinking, so what's the general counsel going to do? Is she going to be the bad cop? And then giving us lectures on the law, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So there's kind of like some, uh, I don't know, people like to think that you're the bad guy. But it's just about getting people to accept you, accept your role and function. And you need to show to them that you're here to support them mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. You're not here to dictate or to lecture, but you need to show to them that you're a person, a resource person. Anytime they can knock on your door, they can give you a call, anything they need, you're accessible. So I think communication skill is key. And because you deal with different stakeholders within the organization, you need to understand that these person not necessarily understand legal terms. Mm -hmm. As I would converse with another legal person, it would yeah. be a lot easier. So you need to make sure that whenever you're conveying a message, it's being conveyed in the proper way so that they understand why I'm saying that rather than just saying, you know, this should be done like this, not like that. So just explain to them what are the risks so they would understand and then they will be part of your team as well. So I think that's key. And did you ask for a third quality? Yes, yes, you have um, to go with the third one. <laughs> in terms of third quality, I would say, uh, yeah, a general counsel should be able to bring value to the business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the intention of creating that post and having a general counsel in-house, is to be able to add value to the organization internally and as well to the client service team. Because a Korean, at the end of the day, is a service provider. So a lot of focus is on the quality of service that you provide. And I think my involvement with the client service team is key because whenever they have any query, they know that I'm here. They can just reach out to me. And this is how I bring value to the business because rather than just for a simple query, you wouldn't go to a legal advisor or external lawyer for that. So if it's not legal advice, internet uh, legal advice, just purely questions on how to interpret a particular clause from the constitution or from the shareholder agreement, mm -hmm. they can just have me on the side to help them. So I accompany them in the process and definitely they feel that the quality that is being provided at the end of the day has a lot more value because they're aware how they're doing the work. So this is the, the way that I try to bring value to the business. I remember when I, I, I spent a very short time in-house at, at JP Morgan as mm -hmm. a tax lawyer and I remember my first days starting my new job, very daunting, and my boss, the, this lovely Irish lady who I still keep in touch with, told me, Joanne, take two years to learn about the business. Okay. The most important thing is the business. If you don't understand the business, forget about the law, anyone can pick up a book these days. You need to learn about the business and I think it's incredibly important what you just described. I fully agree with you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back on the first quality you mentioned, that adaptability, mm -hmm. agility that you must have. Mm -hmm. Do you find it a bit daunting being required to know a bit about everything? At times it can be a little bit frustrating, especially when you're getting something new, you, you have to go back to the rules, go back to the law, uh, go on the Supreme Court website, look out for the law, do some research, see if we've got articles written on that. But I think at the end of the day, for me, it's very satisfying because I get to learn new things every day. There's no day which is boring for me <laughs> within the organization, just to say. Um, but I think that because it depends on on you. I think it depends on what are your requirements, what are your ambitions. For me, I like having to go through things, learning new things every day. So I, so far, I haven't found it that daunting, mm -hmm. but more of a challenge maybe, more of a learning curve. But it's, it's interesting, it's interesting. Do you have any support or uh, interns or, or, or some help or is it just mm. you at the moment? It's just me at the moment. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just me. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully as we go along, uh, maybe further down the line, maybe two years, three years, I don't know. But at the moment, you know, just like I'm saying, there, is, there was no person there. So it's now that we are getting to see that there is work or for legal to do internally. When you go in-house, you realize the amount of work that there is, and every day the amount of work keeps growing, growing, growing. But it's, it's for me to, at some point, sit down at the end of the year, maybe after two years, to sit down and look, 
what are the things that I've done for the organization? What are the things that have been remedied? How much work there is to do? And then probably if there is a business case to have someone to provide me with some kind of support, I'll take it there when I reach there. So there is a mantra that I like to repeat to myself. I didn't invent it. It's a guy, an investment guy I follow on LinkedIn uh, called Ray Dalio. And he always emphasizes the importance of having meaningful relationships and doing meaningful work. So coming back on the point that you mentioned before about the top three qualities, how important is it for you to build those relationships? I think um, the ability to maintain relationship within the organization as a general counsel is fundamental. Because the, person you, the persons you deal with on a daily basis are numerous. You have several stakeholders, different people coming from different departments. You can have HR, finance, client team. And not only that, you have a relationship to maintain outside the ex organization as well. For example, with external lawyers who are representing you in court cases. So you have to build that relationship with them as well. Also with other external lawyers that you might want to reach on behalf of clients. So it's all about building that network. And as a general counsel, I also need to have a relationship with other stakeholders. For example, um, auditors. I need to make sure that they understand what's my role and how I can assist them in terms of information that they require from the company. With insurers as well, I would say authorities as well, because at times, you know, there may be a problem internally. They need someone to pick up the phone and call someone, try to see what's a solution, what solution you can offer. So I try to build that relationship with the FSC, with the MRA, with the registrar of companies, because these are the, the, the authorities we deal with uh, mm -hmm. most of the time. So I would say that it's very important to have a very good relationship. And also coming to the fact that I am the general counsel for the local Mauritius office. I have to report back to the group. So there is a group general counsel, which is based in Jersey. So it's important for me to have that relationship with the group as well, because whatever is being done at the local office needs to be reported back to the general counsel. Or the vice versa is also true. For example, if there is something that is being implemented at group level and they want to have it implemented at the level of the Mauritius office, so I would be the bridge between the two and making sure that there is good progress in terms of implementing, for example, policies or a specific framework which needs to be similar and harmonized across the group. So all this, you have to know how to deal with them. So it's all about maintaining relationship and enforcing that relationship. And I want to now to come to you with a question that I'm going to ask every single one of mm -hmm. our guests on the GC on the GC series. What do you look for in an external counsel? When you're, if you have a client saying, Hasina, I know that um, you're the in-house counsel, you can't advise us. Can you recommend me someone? Internally, we have some kind of policy when it comes to referring work to external lawyers. So for us, it's given that we are part of a global network, Korean is a global uh, corporate service provider, we have um, offices in different jurisdictions, more than 10 jurisdictions and counting. We have a wide client base. So whenever we're looking to refer or to reach out to, to law firms on behalf of client, we always bear in mind the quality of the work. Mm -hmm. We always bear in mind the professionalism, the persons who are within the, the, the law firm, the way they work. Also, we try to look for, for, for law firms that have a global outreach. So that would be a law firm that forms part of a network because some of our clients have a business across the world in different jurisdictions. So what we try to do is, for example, if we know that there is a law firm in Mauritius which has presence in other jurisdictions as well, it would be a lot easier to connect the client with this kind of law firm so that they can then jump to that same law firm in a different jurisdiction. We try to achieve that. Well, to be honest, we don't have many law firms in Mauritius, but it all depends on what are the requirements of the client? At times, the nature of the business calls for something which probably is the specialty of one specific law firm, for example. Mm -hmm. So I would say that these are the elements that would dictate to which law firm we would approach. And also, if I may say, we know for sure that there are certain law firms that work closely with certain management mm -hmm. company. And 
we try to avoid these ones <laughs> because clearly when we are referring work to a law firm, what we are trying to achieve at the end of the day is to try to build a relationship with that law firm as well. Thank you for that. I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> okay. Now, the next question I wanted to ask you, I think it's also an incredibly important component of being a GC, is to be a good risk manager. So in your view, what are the main components of being a good legal risk manager? I think you need to be very alert to how the organization function. You need to be alert to whatever changes is happening within the legislative framework that needs to be incorporated within the business. So that would require you to be also alert to what are the gaps within the system, what are the risks, and you need to flag it up. And this is the hardest part, because when you flag something up, this is where it might create some, a, a little bit of a, fa of a havoc, because it might be that previously they were doing it this, this way, there was no problem. But your role as, as the general counsel is to at times be the bad cop. I'm sorry, but this is how it is. But it is in the interest of the company. So you need to be able to flag the risk and also suggest um, remedial action that wouldn't necessarily disrupt the business. So I think that's key. I'm trying to develop that as a personal skill as well. That is not only uh, know what the law say, but try to apply it and then try to give them solution as well from a commercial and a business perspective. I think that's very key. I agree with you. And I think that sometimes it's, it's easy to lose sight of the business when you're, you have your lawyer hat on. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes very easy to think, I need to do my job as a lawyer. But to find that right balance with doing your job as a lawyer and letting them get on with their business is, is a tricky one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like you've rightly mentioned, it's about striking the right balance between the two because on one side, there's you as the legal person knowing the law, what needs to be done, what are the risks. And on the other side, you've got the business team wanting to go ahead with a particular project and not wanting any hurdles, but you're there just watching out. And then you just need to make sure that you're able to find a mutual solution where the legal team is happy and the business team is happy as well, but not disrupt the whole thing. Of course. Now, you are, I find you, Asina, have to say, incredibly <laughs> self-aware and very passionate about what you do. For someone who's been in your role for such a short period of time, you sound like you've got it sussed mm. out so far. So um, <laughs> I'm sure there's always room for growth and learning, but you, 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 you are incredibly passionate about, about really your role. <laughs> <laughs> what advice, what, if you had a single piece of advice that you could give to a young aspiring barrister or attorney who wants to move in-house, what would that be? I would tell that young, young person not to rush things. Mm -hmm. I will ask that person just to take the time learn the work, um, see the ups and downs, learn the different aspect of the job, take at least, I would say, two to three years mm -hmm. to understand what's the, what the work is really about. And most importantly, I would encourage that person to have a mix practice. So probably do like a little bit in, in litigation, then do a little bit in corporate, have a good balance of both. It may be like, okay, more than more corporate, less litigation, but at least have some litigation. And I would ask them to be patient because I've been there. I know when you're young, you want to rush, you want to reach, you're ambitious, but it takes time. And even when I, I joined as an in-house and looking back, I was grateful that I've been in private practice. I was grateful that I've been in a law firm before because that's not a role that you can just go in just being called to the bar, just go in a company and say, okay, I'm just going to give, I'm just going to work as a general counsel. It doesn't work this way. You need to be equipped with that knowledge and experience and then move on. And to be honest, when you just join the practice, take some time, go to court, wear your gown, mingle with your colleagues. It's good to have that that knowledge as well and have that experience as well and when to be honest when you look for at the at the newspaper or any vacancy on linkedin for an in-house position they never ask for someone who just been called to the bar they will sure. always look for two to four years experience so you've got time just take that time build a solid foundation and you'll reach there 
You, it, it's interesting to hear you talk so fondly about private practice. So last question for you. What do you miss most and what do you miss least about private practice? What I miss most is definitely my gown. <laughs> like I mentioned previously, <laughs> I miss the decorum of the court. It's something else. I miss the interaction with the bench. I miss uh, meeting my colleagues. I definitely miss the the vibrance of Portlaoise. <laughs> now I'm do in you? Eben. Yes, I, I do miss that. that. <laughs> no, I, I, for me, Eben is more like that corporate, serious environment. But in Port, it's just more vibrant, and I miss that a little bit. And coming to what I miss the least, it's going to be definitely missing the feeling of preparing the case for the tenth time and having it postponed for the eleventh time. So. That's what I miss the most, <laughs> going to court, waiting for long hours and then you hearing... You oh, missing the least, that's what you miss the least. <laughs> yes, I miss that the least because, yes, you just stress, you've prepared for the case, you got everything, you're ready to fight the case and then you hear it's been postponed, you're disappointed. Then and you the thing is, you will time. never be able to prepare the case the same way you did the first time. Of course. So I think that's the one thing that I miss the, the least. Uh, well, that's it. Well, Thank you so much for sitting down with us today, Hasna. It's been so refreshing to hear someone at the start of their in-house journey. I wish you a very long and fruitful career as a GC. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you. And going through the different questions, I kind of realized how I've grown over the year, over one year. And I hope to see that cross much more in the future, yes. But thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to discuss a little bit about my role in fashion.